Okay. Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard University. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Brandon Stanton, the creator of Humans of New York. It's particularly special to me because before I came to Cambridge last fall, I spent nearly 15 years as a human of New York. <laughs> Waking in the morning and stepping to the streets whose people speak 800 languages and being a part of the endless flow of humanity is something that many of us New Yorkers don't fully appreciate until it's gone. But thanks to Brandon's vision and work, to his blog and that beautiful book, I'm still able to get my New York fix. Humans of New York is a quintessence of America's great city, but it, but it is also, of course, about our world at large, a celebration of both our wondrous diversity, our common humanity, and a joyful declaration that whatever this life is, we're all in it together. It was Brandon's genius to discover how to show us to ourselves and to remind us of how compelling and astounding and how magical we all are. It may be a little corny now to say that, to say this, but Humans of New York is also a very American tale of never giving up on one's dream. Brandon's parents were rightly proud that he had established himself in a promising career in the bond market. Then one day he picked up a camera and before long he quit his job and went off to photograph cities. Well, tonight we are thrilled and grateful that Brandon had the courage to dream, the brilliance to make it real, and the generosity of heart and mind that makes humans of New York such a great gift to our country and our world. Now, if this was a month ago, I would have finished this and just gone and sat down, but no. <laughs> <laughs> About three weeks ago, something pretty incredible started happening around the country and around the world. It all began when Brandon had a chance meeting with a young human named Vidal. But I'll let him tell you the story. Please join me in welcoming to Harvard, Brandon Stanton. Thank you, Thank you so much. Please, Thank you. This is intimidating. This, <laughs> I feel like I'm in Game of Thrones right now, like I'm, I'm about to fight the mountain. Um, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, all of you guys have, or most of the people here, have gotten into Harvard, so I know you were the ones in class that were getting the hundreds on the class presentations while I sat in the back like, oh God, this person's making me look bad. Um, so if my presentation skills fall a little short, um, blame that. Uh, yeah, I, I like to kind of start with something funny. Uh, you know, I always try to think of a joke to get things going. And um, I logged on to the weather this morning. <laughs> and I'm about to show you, assuming this works, if it doesn't, I'm going to be the joke. I want to show you guys a weather map of the entire northeastern United States. All right, you ready? <laughs> How hilarious is that? <laughs> let's, let's zoom in on Boston here. Oh, wait, hold on. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, snow's fun. <laughs> it really is. Oh, it's my favorite, it's my favorite thing to photograph in, and like the more dehabilitating it is, the more fun it is, because it's just, no, I'm serious, it's just like, it, it's the great equalizer, I mean, you've got the Goldman Sachs guy walking through the snow like this, you know, <laughs> oh man, so I love it, um, here's my blog, uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, so, I kind of wanted to structure the speech today uh, based on, you know, kind of starting with some of the amazing things that Humans of New York has been able to accomplish in, you know, these 
last few months that I think were kind of unique for something on social media. And then I'll kind of go back and, and tell the story of how it came to be where it is. And one of the highlights of my life recently was being able to go into the Oval Office and interview briefly along with this amazing educator and this amazing student from Brownsville, Brooklyn, and to be able to interview the President of the United States. And because I think it relates to what I'm going to be talking about later, I want to read the last thing that he said. And when he, he was talking in this about the toughest moment of his life, and it was after he lost a campaign. And the way he said that he handled it is to focus on the work. He says, the way I got through that moment and any other time that I felt stuck is to remind myself that it's about the work. Because if you're worrying about yourself, if you're thinking, am I succeeding? Am I in the right position? Am I being appreciated? Then you're going to end up feeling frustrated and stuck. But if you can keep it about the work, you'll always have a path. There's always something to be done. And you know, one of the amazing things that I think about Humans of New York is that, you know, I didn't have a Harvard degree. You know, I lost my job. I was, I didn't have much photography experience, but I was willing to work hard. And we have gotten to a place today where a guy that four years ago with no photography experience and this crazy idea and this willingness to kind of go out and work very hard every single day can have a partnership with the United Nations. They actually let me put my name next to theirs. <laughs> I'm serious, that's a huge deal. Like that, a lot of paperwork went into that. Uh, and, and actually, the, the thing in the corner, uh, the, the views expressed in the blog are those of individuals and not necessarily express or reflect the views of the United Nations Red Program. That was the result of like a crisis email like a month or like three weeks in because uh, people, I mean, that's, I, I love, I don't know if you guys follow that, like the United Nations took a giant step in saying that, that you know, we believe in the intrinsic value of your work, which is, believing in the intrinsic value of stories and individuals. And we don't think that there's anything dangerous about putting our name and our brand next to the stories of the people and the individuals that we are trying to help. And so for them to allow me to kind of partner in them, and they just said, they just said, do your work. Just do what you do. Don't try to tell any message with it. Just do your work. And again, for somebody to be able to achieve this, with honestly, I don't know many people. My Rolodex is not that big. It's you know maybe a, a couple pieces of paper, friends from back in Georgia, you know, not have much money, not have you know the fancy degrees, but just to have a great idea and a willingness to work hard and to be able to do something that impactful. I think that's an amazing statement about where we are today. And the uh, the third thing is just how well the book is done. And I gotta. I got to tell you guys this funny story. I don't. I hope this doesn't get me in trouble. Um, on the Ellen DeGeneres show um, last week, and it was unlike any show that I had ever been on before. Because normally, when you're going out, the producers like, yeah, just you know, they're going to ask you some questions. Just be yourself. Just just be yourself. Be comfortable. They, you had to practice to go on Ellen. You, know, you had to sit, had to sit down with the producer, and you kind of had to go through the pre-interview questions, and then they tell you, you know, we like that. Make sure you hit on that when you're out there. And um, so when I was talking to him, you know, I said I kind of happened to mention, you know, that I don't even think I'm that great of a photographer, and the producer was like, oh yeah, hit on that. <laughs> he said, he said, he said. That will make you likable. Ah, people, people love self-deprecation. Just hit on the fact, <laughs> hit on the fact that you're not that good of a photographer. And he goes, "Go again, practice." I'm like, "Okay." I go, "Well, you know, I, I, uh, I really think it's amazing. You know, the book's been on the bestseller list for 30 weeks, and I'm not that good of a photographer." And he goes, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa." He goes, "Don't say that part about the uh, the 30 weeks. That 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 makes you look arrogant." He goes. <laughs> Just say you're a crappy photographer. <laughs> so, like, so I always say that, you know, the reason I talk about the accomplishments beforehand, the, the Oval Office interview, the UN tour, the, the, the uh, New York Times number one best-selling book is because I'm a horrible photographer. <laughs> and, you know, I, I say that... <laughs> uh, 
it, I, I say that with a smile on my face because I just like I'm almost proud of it because it it shows you know what anyone's capable of doing that you know just kind of there's a power in the concept and a, and a power in the idea where I can take a photo that's kind of out of focus and trust me I notice I notice you know it's in the comment section like Ugh, and I'm like I know I know um, <laughs> You know, that, that my you know, photo can be out of focus or the composition is not perfect, but you know, I had an idea that was new. You know, I, I had an idea that I thought brought something to the world and I kind of stuck to it. And because of where we've come as a society and the kind of tools of distribution, that I have been in a, a position where I can speak to you guys today, I could have never gotten into the school, nowhere close, you know? And that I could be sitting here today or standing here today and sharing what I've learned from you guys. It's a very modern phenomenon. You know, 10, ten years ago, this wouldn't have been possible. I would have had, for my work to be known 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the editor of the art section of the New York Times would have had to have taken an interest in me. You know, the, the editor, the art critic of New York Magazine. You know, for me to have just strapped on some shoes, I, I was broke when I moved to New York, and just go out there every single day and figure it out. And what Humans in New York started as, it, it would look nothing like it did today. And then somebody asked me, I got a real good warm up for this as a Harvard Crimson. I knew you guys were gonna be asking me tough questions. <laughs> You're smart. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, they, I, I guess one of the questions they asked me is, you know, how, how did it develop or what advice could I give? And, you know, I, the, the one thing, or, or what about, they said a lot of people in the audience might be you know, trying to balance their creative aspirations with the, their not need for security or their kind of, you know, more formal ambition to make a lot of money or their parents' expectations. And I said, how can, how can you encourage someone to, to, to follow their creative career or give their advice? And, you know, the one thing that I said is that, first of all, anyone can do it. You know, you don't, it's, she said, how, what do you talk to people who feel like they can't do something creative? Like, anyone can do it. And I think the one thing that holds most people back from doing it is that they're waiting for that perfect idea to cut the rope behind them and start putting their energies towards something they really want to be doing or they're really passionate about. Because they, they need that silver bullet in their mind that, oh, I have that such a good idea that the risk is so limited that it's worth it now for me to step off in doing that. And what I think Humans of New York serves as an example is that the Humans of New York that is now successful and that has become big looks nothing like the humans of New York that I set out to do, uh, that, uh, that I committed my life to. The commitment that I made was not, I am going to make a successful blog of stories where I interview people in the street, not even close. It wasn't even that I was going to commit myself to making a big photography blog. The commitment I said to myself after two years of trading bonds, I am gonna commit myself to structuring my life where my time is my priority and not money. I'm going to figure out a way to make enough money where I own my time. And that was the commitment I made. And I said, if I had all the time in the world, what would I do? And I, the time, I love photography. I didn't have much experience in it, but I loved it. And I said, I would photograph all day. So that was my goal. I'm gonna try to make just enough money so where I can photograph all day. And that's what started the path towards Humans of New York. I went out every single day and I just started taking pictures of everything. Then I started moving towards pictures of people, always moving towards the one thing I thought I was doing that was more and more unique. I was taking lots of pictures of, of everything that, that I see a lot of on the internet. Then I started taking pictures of people that was a little bit more rare. Then I started stopping people on the street. And that was kind of hard because it was nerve wracking. And suddenly, I know some of you guys are in business school, I had a competitive advantage. <laughs> because I didn't know much about photography, but I could approach strangers on the street, and I was bad at it at first, but I got better and better and better at it. And then I started taking portraits of people on the street, and then I started, and that's where humans, that's what I moved to New York to do. The original goal was I was gonna take 10,000 portraits of people on the street. They look like this, that guy's hilarious. Yeah, I know, I, I know you guys got a lot of questions, so I'm gonna go through this kind of fast. 
And this is when it really changed. And again, I always say, don't wait for perfect. You can't wait till you have the perfect idea to follow your dreams. You've got to just trust in structuring your time in the way you want and flesh it out through evolutions. This was the evolution that really put Humans of New York on a sustainable basis. I saw this woman. I took an awful picture of her. I mean, like, ugh. Um, <laughs> but I remember she told me something. She said, I used to be a different color every single day, but one day I was green, and that was the best day of my life. And she told me that. And remember, at that point, I was just taking photographs. That's all I was doing. And I had a very small Facebook following, maybe 1,000 people to see me take these pictures of people on the street. And um, you know, I just kind of put that little quote with her. And suddenly, it was the most popular picture I've ever had. And then I found it. I found, oh, I don't have much experience you know, in photography. I'm not that technically proficient. I don't have a Harvard degree. But you know, I've approached about 2,000 people now on the streets. I'm getting pretty damn good at taking a stranger and making them feel comfortable. That's what Humans of New York is. And ever since I made that discussion, something that I could do through all the work that I did, that maybe all these people with all these advantages and money and connections couldn't do because they haven't put in the legwork and stopped thousands of people on the street. Ever since I made that, Humans of New York has become an effort at me getting as good as possible at stopping someone on the street, making them feel comfortable, and finding out an intimate story about their lives. And I've done this thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and I'm still getting better at it. You know, how do you, first, how do you let somebody even stop and let you take their picture? That's hard. I mean, I went all the way around the world. I went to Iraq, South Sudan. I went to Iran. I went to the Democratic Republic of Congo. There's nowhere I get turned down more than New York City. Seriously. <laughs> I remember I came back from that UN trip. I went to Central Park. I got turned down like 10 times in a row. I'm just like, oh, my God, I forgot how hard this is. So even that, just even getting over that bump, then once somebody has let you talk to them, you know, asking them questions that reveal something about them. And what I'm always looking for is a story. Because remember, the path of humans of New York, what was it? I was always looking for something that I could do differently. You know, whether it was taking pictures of people, portraits of people, portraits of people with quotes. And then even when I'm talking to people, I'm always saying, how can I portray something different about this person that is uniquely theirs. And I say that's almost always a story. That's almost never an opinion. You know, people say, why isn't humans in New York? Why don't you use your power for political means or things? Because I'm telling stories. And the moment you are asking to, talking to somebody for the purpose of, of projecting any sort of politics, no matter how beneficial it is, are you really listening to that person? Are you really listening to that person? Are you waiting for them to say the things that fits into your agenda. So I take each person and I always say, I want a story from this person that I haven't heard from anybody else. And that's almost never an opinion. We all have similar opinions, but we all have unique stories. So I will ask the questions to try to get to the story that has happened to them that I have never heard before. And then when I get to there, that's when I know I have my caption. And so, you know, just getting back to this, now that I've kind of told the progression, you know, it was just, it was an unbelievable honor for a Facebook page to, to get to sit down with the president and ask a few questions. I, I don't know if it's ever happened before. And, you know, as I told in the story, this was all centered on work. This was centered on me. I mean, I'm, I had nothing when I moved to New York. I slept on a mattress. I had no money. And everybody thought I was crazy, but I went out there every single day, every single day, and just stopped people and photographed them every single day. Because why? Because I wanted to control my own time. And I said that's what I would do if I had my own time, and I made that commitment to myself. And so when I did have my own time, I did it. And through these kind of evolutions that have happened, just through focusing on my work, focusing on my work, this, this audience grew up and this influence grew up that gave me that sort of access. And it's such a 21st century story. And I will say that the Harvard degree you guys are going to get will be less valuable than it ever has been before, because the playing field is being leveled with, to put tools and power in the hands of people that will never have achieved this success before. However, 
the work ethic and the smarts that you guys have that got you into this school will be more valuable than ever because you will now have the tools to shape your lives to where you don't have to worry about going to the cocktail parties and meeting the important people or making the right connections or getting the venture capital funding because the tools in society are constantly evolving to where distribution will be handled by the platforms. You know, the, I don't need money to distribute my work because it goes through these millions of feeds. All I have to focus on is my work, and that's very empowering. And that theme is only gonna continue to evolve. Thank you. <laughs> we don't get to sit okay. down yet. Okay, um, you've been in the forum, you've heard these rules, but let me just repeat them for everyone who's, who's new. All questioners must identify themselves. Not a long story, just your name. One brief question per person. No speeches. We have a speech maker here. Please in, I don't know why they always say this, please in your question with a question mark. That's so everyone knows it's a question. Okay, so um, there's a mic here, there's a mic up there. We can start now. Okay, you're first at bat. Thanks. Thank you, Brandon, for coming here. Um, I'm Ignacio, I'm a freshman at the college. My question is, your blog has millions of followers mm -hmm. and the internet isn't always a very nice place. But no matter what, whenever I click on your pictures, there's comments with thousands of likes, and they're almost always positive. What do you think it is about your page and your pictures that brings out the best in people? Um, the, I mean, for, that's also what you just described is something I'm extremely proud of, is that despite how big Humans of New York is, 12 million people, there's a culture there. And it's so hard to maintain a culture as, I mean, just ask a startup that goes from 10 people to 200 people. Um, and so for with that large of a segment of the population to be in one place and the comment sections to be overwhelmingly positive that, like you described is, is something that I'm extremely proud of. Um, you know, I would just say I have addressed in a couple direct posts, you know, kind of commenting etiquette. But the bottom line is I just think that mean people get bored with humans of New York and they don't participate. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not a, we don't, I'm not looking to judge people or, you know, analyze people or just kind of, I'm just letting people kind of speak their own words. And, you know, I, I genuinely care about the people that I talk with. I'm very concerned with, you know, how they view their experience. Um, and, you know, I think that just energy kind of infuses things and it's kind of self-moderating. Uh, and just the bottom line is, I think people that are looking to make fun of people, you know, or people who are looking to be judgmental or opinionated, they come, they don't find what they're looking for, and they move on. And what you're left with is a community of supportive people without which Humans of New York would not be possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, this, I, nobody would let me agree to photograph them if that culture didn't exist. Um, because it would be an awful experience, an awful experience. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's something I'm proud of, and I, it's something that I hope to maintain. Okay. Lady right here. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. My name is Monica Cost, and some of the work I do, there's a phrase I use called take the label off the table. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if in your um, leaving bond tradesmen to becoming, or bond trading to becoming a photographer, did you have to fight the societal labels of what that meant, and if so, how'd you do that? Um, you know, honestly, I, I didn't notice it that much. Um, you know, I think everyone, bond trading was kind of an anomaly in my life anyway. I was a history major, um, and you know, I kind of fell into that uh, because my friend who was a finance major was working at a firm. I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time, and he got me an interview. Um, so, you know, I've always been kind of very creative and, and artistically inclined, um, though I couldn't paint or draw, so I just never knew what to do with it. Um, you know you're an artist if, if, if you recognize beauty. I think if you're attuned to beauty, um, then if you, if you really appreciate beauty, that's when you know you're an artist, even if you can't paint or that you have the technical skills. That's kind of, and I, it's just, I always knew that I was, I had a lot of appreciation for the world and I always felt like an artist. 
but I, I didn't know what to do with it because I wasn't technically proficient in anything, and some would argue I'm still not. Um, and uh, yeah, and so the, the bond trading thing was never really a big part of my identity. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't, I don't think many other people saw it as part of my identity either. Yeah. Okay, right here. Hi, Brandon. Um, my name's Joanne, I'm a junior at the college. Um, and first and foremost, thank you for keeping us company through the stories that you tell every day. And you have obviously influenced thousands of people through the work that you do. Thank I'd you. like to know um, who's had the greatest influence on your life. Oh, you uh, <laughs> see the crimson prepared me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I got asked that, and that is definitely my girlfriend, Erin, who's sitting in the front row blushing right now, I'm sure. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's, <laughs> um, this, Humans of New York was started from a good place. Um, I genuinely like people, I genuinely care for people, and I genuinely like to talk to people. And when you get to a certain level, you know, it's very easy for you to kind of take on the mindset and the ethos of people in power and people with money, whereas in everything kind of has a more what are you getting out of it kind of, you know, ethos. And just to, uh, you know, be able to come home every night and uh, spend time with somebody who kind of reminds me of who I am uh, is good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Jang. I'm from the college. And uh, I was just wondering, like, what, so you were saying, like, you try to make people feel as comfortable as possible, right. and, like, try to find out their life story. Like, what kind of questions do you ask to, like, right. you know, um, that kind of thing? So, you know, what I'm always doing is I'm always looking for a story. And then I find that the most pivotal moments of people's lives can revolve around a certain emotion, whether that be happiness, sadness, anger. And everybody doesn't have an answer to all of these. But I feel if you'll circle around the emotions and you'll, and you'll ask, when was the time you felt most afraid? When was the time you were angriest? When was the time you were saddest? When did you feel the most guilty? What do you feel the most guilty about? Normally, like, the really powerful stories in our lives have a very strong emotion coupled to it. And so those are normally my, very, my broad questions. But if there's magic, it would be in the follow-up questions, is that I, I take a very sincere interest in these stories, and I want to know the details. You know, you see these captions, and it's like, oh, how are these people so articulate? Well, it was a very long process, <laughs> you, you know? Um, it's, you know, I, I want to know exactly what the person was wearing, you know? Exactly where in the room was your mother sitting, you know? Because these are the things that make a story powerful. And these are the things that really bring it to life for somebody and allow them to kind of experience the story along with somebody. So to, to begin with, I normally kind of circle around the larger emotions, and then once there's been a story that, you know, I've kind of identified, then I just follow genuine cur curiosity and just ask, you know, whatever I feel like it, yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Vince. I'm a freshman at the college. Okay. Now, just wondering how you decide to stop certain people on the street. Um, you know, it's, it used to be, um, in, in, even if you look at the, the current book, I'm not sure how many of you guys have the book, the current book looks a lot different than the blog looks like right now. Um, that's because Humans of New York was evolving so fast by the time that was going in, you know, to be published that the blog had kind of changed out from under it. The book is very visual. It's very colorful. A lot of eccentric characters. There's some quotes. There's some commentary from me, which you never get anymore. Um, and so at first it was visual cues. I was looking for people who looked interesting or looked different. Um, and now it's people I can talk to. It's all about the interview process. So I'm looking for people who I look, that look like I can approach, which is there, why there's probably more cigarette smokers on the blog than there are in real life, just because I know if somebody's smoking a cigarette, they got a couple minutes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I al I'm almost always won't approach people in groups um, because I find this is a very interesting paradox that even if somebody knows that 12 million people are going to read the story th that night, if they're next to their friend, they'll clam up. Isn't that interesting? So I'm looking for just people who I can talk to that um, are alone and look like they have a few minutes right now. Yeah. Okay, right here. 
I'm John Clark Levin. I'm a second year master's student here at the Kennedy School. I'm wondering, as Humans of New York has become such a cultural phenomenon and as you have become more recognizable personally, has that ever interfered with your ability to just work on the street without fanfare and also get authentic stories from people? Absolutely. Um, you know, I was, uh, I know this is another one that Crimson helped prepare me for, but I get asked that. <laughs> it's a great question and I get asked it a lot. Um, and the, um, the amount of contrivance in the answers has increased with my ability to sniff them out. You know what I mean? Um, I'm always looking for authenticity. And as the blog gets bigger and bigger, you know, people who know about the blog, you know, a lot of people have thought about what they would like to say. And they know that it's going to be seen a lot of peop uh, by a lot of people. So I tell everybody, I go, if you know the blog, a lot of times people who know the blog are worried about saying the correct thing instead of the honest thing. All I can say is that my goal in all this is a moment of authenticity. And I am very, very quick to steer the interview away. I was telling them, like, when some, you know when somebody's got something prepared. The shoulders go back. What's your greatest struggle right now? My greatest struggle is that humanity seems to be weighed down with a burden that I want to help. <laughs> you know, it's just like, uh, and, and it's like, well, okay, well, what'd you have for breakfast yesterday? You know what I mean? And uh, I find that even, because I was worried about that. I was worried that, you know, if people were really excited about being on the blog all the time, would I be able to get something authentic? And I've actually found that the answer is yes. You can move from that kind of excitement and that nervousness to a very quiet moment of reflection where everything's coming out is on the spot and very authentic and it's very easy to identify. And if I don't get there, it doesn't go on the blog. Yeah. Thank you. Right here. I'm Sarah Milkovich. I'm a senior here at the college and I know that all of us are so excited for the honor to welcome the um, scholars from the middle school yeah. in Brooklyn. Yeah. And I was just wondering if there's a way that we as students can be a part of welcoming them and hosting them here. Um, I'm sure there is. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I imagine that the, the um, probably the coordinating just for it to be logical and practical will start somewhere um, with an administrator or something. Um, Ms. Lopez and I especially, I mean, Ms. Lopez is running a school at all times. So yeah, and uh, by the time when I finish this, my you know to-do list had stacked up so high with um, you know Humans of New York that we're both trying to kind of get back into the, the mode of being able to handle our daily tasks. Then we'll sit down. Um, Aaron and I are going to come back uh, with, the, with the group. And we're very excited about it. Only thing I know about it, she says she wants to come in the middle of the week. She says she wants to take over the campus in the middle of the week. Uh, so you guys, you, guys will probably, you guys will probably see us walking around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I would just say um, if, if there is something um, that we figure out that maybe I can announce it on the blog later. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Up here. Hi, Brandon. Uh, my name is Tasneem. I'm a sophomore in the college, and I wanted to know what happens after you take the photograph. How do you respond when somebody tells you a story that's so personal? Right. Um, well, you know, there's obviously an, you know an emotional response a lot of times when you're talking to the person. Um, and uh, as far as you know, I think the the more relevant thing is how do I respond to sharing it with 12 million people and how do they respond to it and it's something that I'm always very nervous about because going back to the culture question you know if, if humans of New York is not a comfortable place for people to be there's nobody's gonna be on it you know because it's getting to the point where just about you know almost everyone in New York is starting to know about it um, and so I always when I see somebody the first question I ask them is, is was it a good experience you know are you okay it's intimidating you know um, even when I put myself on the blog, you know, at any time, I get nervous, you know, because when the comments are directed at me, you know, that's, that's when I kind of like to, you know, stay behind, stay behind the curtain. But from, you know, everything I've heard, I've just been amazed that, you know, the vast, vast majority of people are, are happy with how they were represented. They feel it was authentic. Um, if somebody, you guys might have noticed, if you're a really close follower of the blog, that a photo disappeared last night. Um, if somebody has second thoughts and they contact me, I immediately take it down. Um, and 
I, I won't change the caption. A lot of times it's, you know, instead of saying that, can you say that humanity's greatest burden is, uh, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll never change the caption, but whenever somebody wants it down, I'll always take it down, yeah. Right here. Hi, Brandon. My name Hi. is Rachel Freed. I'm a sophomore at Melrose High, so congrats to all the people out of high school here. You made it. <laughs> you're, you're living the dream. But you meet a lot of amazing people. Do you try and stay in touch with any of them? Um, some of them, I mean, I just, I have a hard time staying in touch with my family right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, just because I, I'm one dude producing content for 12 million people. Like, that itself is a very heavy burden, you know. I feel a lot of pressure to go out every day and, like, don't stop, you know, just, like, don't mess it up, don't stop, you know. Um, because, I mean, that story that I told, this is this amazing story of all that's happened to this, you know, one dude. But then at the same time, the responsibility for maintaining it, for growing it, for sustaining it, and to continue producing the content, you know, ultimately falls on me. And so, you know, it's, you know, one of my challenges is to, <laughs> to kind of separate my life from Humans of New York, not always being worried about, you know, uh, I'm running out of photos, I don't have anything to post tomorrow, the things I do have to post are all kind of the same, I need more varied, I need more men, I need more women, I need this neighborhood, I need that neighborhood. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, you know, very, I guess going back to the question, you know, there's not as much time, I guess, as I would like to, you know, really kind of follow up with everybody I meet on the street, yeah. Here. Hi, my name is Harriet, I'm a junior in the college. How do you say, you went to the UN tour and you were able to like tour to Kenya, DRC, Congo, and like Iran. How do you say it was the most impactful story that you had in one of those countries and I mean, any impact that you had? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the strongest ones, I mean, emotionally, were, had to be the refugees and the, you know, the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan. Whereas in, you know, if you read the blog, I'm not sure who was following then, I mean, just atrocious stories, just very, very strong detail about the, your father getting killed in front of your face or, you know, watching your brother get murdered. And you look at that and you think, wow, you know, that guy went around and found the most sensational stories in the camp. When in reality, I was just stopping random people who were walking by me. And just to know that the, just the people displaced, I mean, there's, there's this sort of mass kind of amorphous tragedy to a group of people displaced by war. But getting in front of those people and finding out the individual tragedies with their own cast of characters, their own details, their own very detailed, for very uh, you know varied experiences and tragedies, it's just very, very, I don't know, it's, it's very eye-opening and very powerful. Um, and so, yeah, it's not, the one way I described it, it's like, it's not, it goes beyond the realization that, wow, this person is like me, to that's me, just in different circumstances. You know what I mean? And that's a, it's a very powerful distinction. Uh, and I would say that that was kind of a, a, common, a common theme to the impact of the interviews over there for me. Yeah. Okay, right here. Hey, Brandon. Hey. Uh, my name is Lucas. I'm a freshman at the college. And my question for you is, um, like personally, for you, um, like I want a moment of authenticity from Brandon standing here. <laughs> um, what was the most significant or, or most memorable photograph, quote, maybe conversation moment you had in your career? And I don't want, I don't want the, you know, the photo that blew up the most, that got the most love from the community. I, you know, uh, just something that was most meaningful to you inside. Yeah, uh, that is, uh, it's, well, it's, it's, it's so hard because you ask for an ultimatum, like one, but at the same time, that's what I do to other people. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's only fair. I, I don't know if, I, if maybe if I reflect on it afterwards, I'll think of something different. But there on New Year's Eve one night, uh, we were in Central Park and we were watching the fireworks display. And then there was this man in a wheelchair Okay, and he was dressed in tuxedo and he had a top hat on. It was just a very romantic scene. And I, I took a picture of him, stroke of midnight, stroke of midnight of a new year. These fireworks are going off. And uh, I asked him what the saddest moment of his life was. And he said, when I tried to kill myself and I woke up and I was still alive. And the depth 
of experience that was kind of encapsulated in those the, those one word or those short words really kind of affected me, especially the timing of them. You know, New Year starting and then the fireworks going off. Um, but yeah, I guess he had tried to you know jump in front of a train, and he woke up and was paralyzed instead, and that that was a uh, very powerful you know, interview. Hi, my name is Amy Tan, and I'm a freshman at the college. Um, and you've heard a lot of really tragic stories and also really happy stories. What have been some of your most um, impactful lessons you've learned or epiphanies you've experienced? Um, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that, that's hard to nail down again, while again acknowledging that I ask people to nail this stuff down all the time. Um, but, you know, I do say that pretty much anything that happens to me in my life right now it's, there's a Humans of New York quote that reminds me of it. Like, oh man, somebody was telling me they went through the exact same thing, you know what I mean? Because I've talked to so many people about their experiences. So, you know, where it's, it's, it's kind of hard to, to nail down. Here's one. I nailed one down. Because I ran into this guy just a couple days ago. You know how I was talking with you guys about the work and it all being about the work and the work being the one thing you control? And I was talking with somebody over here about all this pressure to keep it going. And the way I handle that pressure is I narrow it down and I say, what's the one thing that I can control? And that's the amount of work I do, the work that, as I said, got me here. So what I do is I try to be insanely puritanical about going out and working every single day. When I photographed the president, the next day I didn't feel like working. I just, I was just like, ah, you know, I got to take a break. And I ran into a guy that I had photographed on the street and I asked if he could give one piece of advice to a large group of people, what would he say? And he said, if you have a code in life that you tell other people, never make an exception of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, so I went out and I got a couple photos that day. Um, but I think that's a great thing. You know, we all have things we tell other people, but then we find extenuating circumstances in our own lives that allow us to make an exception of ourselves just this once or just this once. So... I guess that impacted me in a big way, yeah. Thanks. Oh, right here. Hey, hey uh, I'm Andrew, and I'm a New Yorker. Um, I know sometimes, yeah, <laughs> uh, I also go here. But uh, I know sometimes you've had to take down controversial photos. Like, I believe there was one instance of, like, a Sudanese woman <laughs> who talked about, like, yeah. how she was frequently asked to prostitute herself. Right, right. And I know you don't have, like, a political agenda right. coming in. So how do you choose which stories to share yeah. and include, especially when they deal with like super sensitive subjects? Right. Uh, well, you, one thing to remember is that this blog is five years old. So basically everybody has watched me figure it out as I go along. I'm like, oh, you can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. So what happened in this situation is I walked up on a Sudanese woman and a Hasidic Jewish man that were talking on the street. And I, this was very, very early on in Humans of New York, and I was just kind of attracted to it as a, as a visual. Um, it's like, oh, diversity, New York, beautiful. Um, and so I took the photo, and I kind of started talking to them afterwards. And then the man w leaned in, and he whispered something to the woman. And she said, get away from me, get away from me. And he, she ran away, and I had taken the photo already. And she said, that man just propositioned me. He offered to give me $500 to um, to sleep with him. And this is very early on in Humans of New York. I was just kind of figuring out what it meant to have a lot of followers and the power and the responsibility and the influence that come. Again, like, you know, every th my entire evolution as an artist and in many ways as a human has been kind of outlined on the public stage. Um, and so I'm thinking, oh, justice. I'm going to tell this story for women. You know, that's what I was thinking. And so I told that story, not really knowing any more than that little glimpse that I got. And it was an absolute lynch mob. Um, every, you know, let's find this guy. The comment section was like so aggressive. Um, I got an email saying that night that the man had been shamed from his community and that his son had tried to kill himself. And... And I, I wasn't going to take it down. And then I was like, okay, you know, this is not my job. You know, this is not my job to be the judge and the jury of other people. 
and, and opening that up to millions of people and letting them decide the, the morality of somebody. I don't care what it appeared like. You know, so I took it down, and then things got worse for me um, because then the feminists came in and started writing all these articles about how I hated women and I was against women. Um, so it was a lesson learned, uh, and it's you know it's it's a it's it was a very tough position that I was in, and this is like the first time you know I think I've kind of given the full backstory of it. Um, but yeah, from that moment I realized that I. With the power that I had and the amount of people I had following me, I could not try somebody on my blog. I could not accuse somebody of a crime without knowing all the facts and then just throw it to 12 million people because that's a very dangerous thing to do. And um, that was the instance that brought that into focus for me. Yeah. Hi, my name's Nick. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, something I read a lot about uh, being an aspiring writer, an aspiring journalist, is about developing a strong voice, and that that's important if you want to get your work out there. And yet, something unique about Humans of New York, like you mentioned, is that you don't add your own commentary, that you don't have your own voice. So do you think that Humans of New York is kind of an anomaly uh, among that phenomenon, or do you think that kind of it's important to let the voice of the people you interview through, or why do you think that that's... Uh, that Humans of New York differs from other content in that way? I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's a great question, um, which is why it's kind of, you know, hard for me to think the answer. You know, the, like you said, I do try to have a voice when I'm talking to my audience, and I think, you know, a large part of the community and the success of the blog, you know, I, I think are the times we raise money when, when I do put myself in front of the audience and kind of explain things, and sometimes I'll write comments. So I do like to think I do have a voice. And, and with that, the one thing I've learned is that you just can't, your voice is, you've got to just talk to 12 million people like you'd be talking to your best friend sitting on the couch. If you want to feel, be authentic. You can't, there's so many people on the internet trying to sound like this guy or sound like that guy or doing that guy. And it's just very transparent. So as far as a voice, no matter what you're working with, you've just got to talk like you would talk to your best friend and don't try to talk like Nicholas Kristof or you know, some, some other Bob Woodward or some, some other journalist that has have made it in the past. Um, but yes, you, my personal goal has been to get out of it as much as possible. In fact, one of the things that make me cringe when I look at early humans of New York is any time I put my own voice into it. I just don't like it. I, just, I, I think that that was an early stage of my evolution and that humans of New York has improved the more I've taken myself out of it. Um, so yes, in, in my specific case, if I can put up a post without my anything I said in quotes at all, then that's the ideal post for me. Yeah. Hey there, uh, my name's Chip and I'm a sophomore here. Um, and I'm from Portland, Maine, but I wanna live and work in New York someday. Um, anyways, so I took this urban sociology class last semester and also what I saw in that class, you see in the media all the every day it's like when you look at cities like New York you see a lot of poverty like racism and like I feel like that's what's like highlighted but I was wondering like from your standpoint as like pretty much a New Yorker um, what what do you think are some like the benefits that c uh, cities like New York have to offer um the I always say that one thing that I noticed I grew up in Georgia lived in Chicago um, you know one thing that was very tangible when I when I walked into New York was that there was kind of a reverse of the normal cultural pressure that exists in a place where most of the time the culture is to not stand out. You know, don't don't be noticed. Be like everybody else, or be a better version of everybody else. Where in cities in general, in New York in particular, the pressure was to stand out. Like the culture, like what are you doing differently? And that was one of the kind of the very first things that. Um, that, that really kind of attracted me to it, uh, especially when I was just doing more visual photography, is that there was a very, a pressure towards self-expression in New York City that kind of a city provides. I think it just naturally attracts people who are trying to self-actualize, and they go to where the resources are, they go to the, the, where the people are, and so you have a, a bunch of people who you know, the culture tends towards self-actualization and self-expression, and it just makes for, if nothing else, very interesting conversation. Yeah. 
Hi, my name is Danielle and I'm a freshman at the college. And the thing that continues to blow my mind about Humans of New York is the reach that it has. You have 12 million plus people who love and follow and feel deeply connected with your blog. And that's a lot of influence to have. How do you manage like, deciding when and how and where to use that influence and what causes to get behind? And do you worry about using it too often or too Right, little? no, absolutely I do. Um, yeah, I, I do view it as something that, you know, it's, it, the more you use it, the, the less power it has. Um, and so obviously I get so many emails about wonderful causes, about people who need money. Um, if you look at the fundraising that we have done on Humans of New York, it has all occurred very organically, uh, just by people I happen to meet on the street telling the stories of the blog. And so every, fundraise, every fundraiser we do is also a story that we're telling that started on the blog and ends on the blog. And so therefore, I am not going outside of the sphere of influence that people have given me, which is to tell stories, and that is where I'm most effective. Um, and so that is the standard that I use. Okay. Here. Hi, Brandon. My name is Mandy. I'm from New York. Um, and one thing I want to commend you on, I've been following you since my freshman year, and I'm a senior now, um, is your ability to really get people to be comfortable enough to share their secrets and release their secrets to you. And I wanted to know how you go about doing that. I think that's really impressive. And a quick, important follow-up. Are you looking for an apprentice? Because I would <laughs> love to shadow <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. um, well, answering the, answering the second one first, um, it is a, a very much a, something that I do alone. So I, 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 I do, I, I know, well, I, I've had this. <laughs> I've had this to say that to so many people, I've and it hurts, that, it, hurt, it hurts that bad uh, every time, but I'm sure you would be the best apprentice ever. Um, um, that might be worse. So <laughs> as far as, and, and like I said, if there's one thing that I, you know, I do say that I don't think I'm that great of a photographer, um, I'm getting a lot better at interviewing, but if there's one thing that I think I might be just about as good as anybody in the world at is, is stopping people on the street and making them feel comfortable, and it's only because I've done it 15,000 times. Um, I, when I first started, I was trying to think about the right thing to say uh, to make somebody feel comfortable, and then I, eventually I realized it has nothing to do with that has everything to do with the energy that you're giving off. And if you're giving off a nervous energy or an anxious energy, you're going to make that person nervous, understandably. And so that's why it's so hard because the only way to not get nervous at something is to do it when you're nervous a bunch of times. So, you know, I got rejected so many times and eventually I just kind of got calm. And I've been, people had said no to me so many times, I just didn't even really care if they said no anymore. And so I walk up, when somebody walks up to you with some sort of expectation on the end, like a credit card, you can sense that, you know? Like, no matter how nice they are, like, hi, how are you? What are you doing? Nice camera, you know what I mean? Like, you can tell if they're gonna ask you for something at the end. There's that kind of, there's that very infinitesimal energy coming off of, of a need or a want. And once, you know, I'd done it so many times and it just kind of became natural and fun and conversational, you know, that, that kind of hitch got off. And it's just like, oh, you know, this person doesn't really want anything to me. They're just actually talking to me. Um, so what I do is I just say, do you mind if I take your photograph? And if, if, if they start, you know, making the face, I pull out the blog and I explain it to them. And it's, then it's just being yourself. And it takes a lot of practice to be yourself uh, on stage, on camera, uh, in front of a stranger. It's just like the practice is getting that self-consciousness and that nervousness away so that you can be yourself. And that took a lot of practice, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, uh, my name is Neil. I'm a student at the law school, a uh, human from New York. Uh, my, my friend wanted me to ask you uh, tips for bond trading, but I don't think anyone wants to hear that. <laughs> and I'm probably um, not the right guy to ask either. <laughs> I got, um, I, I'll get him fired. So you, you talked uh, quite a bit about how you've just continued to evolve and uh, you've taken on all these different uh, projects like what ended last week with fundraising. Right. And you've also mentioned about how you don't want to have an agenda and how you really want to separate that and just listen. And so, I don't know, I'm curious because there comes a point where listening and having people see each other as humans is the agenda. And so, mu so much of what's happening in New York now, say for example with the police, um, and you know all the debates around police community relations, does that make you want to 
you know, find a police officer and tell his story or find somebody who who's dealing with that in your neighborhood and tell that story because that's very much a part of Yeah, of what I mean, need. there is a you know, no no matter how much of it, you know, I try to just be completely blind to all that. There is a certain joy I get when a tattooed gang member tells me a story about his mom or, you know, a policeman in a a city where there's a lot of police brutality you know, tells me about his own fears or his own guilt. And, you know, suddenly it's not us versus them. It's just, again, me in different circumstances. There is a power to that. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, I, it's, it's something that philosophically I try to just completely not look for any particular thing, but just as a human, I, yeah, I do think I, I kind of draw value from not just police, but just any, any person with whom their station in life creates a bias against them. Um, I enjoy showing the side of them that is not their station in life, if that makes sense. Thank you. Right here. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a freshman at the college. I have a bit of a personal question. Um, what's your deepest regret in life? I mean, if applicable, of course. <sighs> yeah. Um, <laughs> that maybe that's Sudanese post? Uh, <laughs> that we were talking about. I mean, uh, like it, personally, like from, <laughs> I guess not like meeting other people, but just like a personal, like, yeah, well, it's just so, I'm so happy right now. Uh, <laughs> th th things are going so good. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's, it's so hard to, um, you know, what would I say? I would have started humans in New York a few years earlier and not gone into finance, but you know, then, that, that's, that's, yeah, that one's, I'm, I know I hate it when people wiggle out, but I'm going to have to wiggle out of that one. Uh, it's just, it's, it's so hard to say just because everything led here. Oh, when uh, the book became a number one New York Times bestseller. And I know it sounds, and here's why, it's deeper than just uh, the kind of the trophy of it. Um, there was a lot of loneliness and pain when I started Humans of New York, where you know, I had no photography experience, so everyone whose opinion I cared about, you know, just thought I was com being completely irrational and stupid and really avoiding employment. Oh, Brandon's moved to New York. He is living off unemployment, like $600 a month or something like that, and he's stopping people on the street. He's just become a complete bum. He doesn't want to work. Seriously, that's what I was getting. And so, you know, I was, I was very uncomfortable. I was skipping meals because I didn't have enough money. And the, there was a lot of like pent up, you know, emotion and kind of need for validation, I guess, that we all feel from that time that when I got that call from my agent and unex who had unexpectedly told me that the book was at the top of the list, it just kind of all came out. It just all came out. I just sat down and cried for like two hours. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, that's, it, that's a pretty easy answer for me. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Brandon. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and my question has to do with a comment you made earlier about how much your blog has evolved within the past few years. Um, do you think that Humans of New York will make any more, I guess, structural or evolutionary changes in the near future? Um, yes. I mean, hopefully always, um, or it will die. Um, the, the two obvious ones um, are kind of wider and deeper. I, I think the deeper, you know, the first, the, the, the I think what Humans of New York is, is in the, the photography, it's in the bubble. It's in the bubble on the street, the interview, the, the making someone feel comfortable. That's the interesting thing, which is why Humans of New York is growing so fast. It gives intimate stories of strangers. So any medium, whether it be video, writing, anything, where that bubble travels, I think Humans of New York goes. So there's a lot of you know, possibilities for evolution along those lines. Two most obvious ones are wider, travel more. Um, and then, you know, one that really broadened the focus, you know, by these last two few weeks is the sticking with the story, still using that format by telling the stories of individuals, but, you know, having them link together, you know, I, I'm very proud of the story of Mott Bridges Academy. I think it's very valuable. Um, and it really made me feel good about my work. Um, and so it kind of, you know, it, it kind of opened up some more thoughts about, you know, maybe maybe the next step isn't necessarily to go wider and travel more, but maybe it's to 
go deeper and stay in New York and and just kind of go further into the community. Question right here. I am Koji. I'm also a New Yorker. Um, I've worked in Brownsville and, and Harlem, um, and I've seen over time an increased like focus on getting into school and getting into elite colleges. And um, that's great in itself, but it also makes me worry a little bit about people missing out of the lesson of, of your pictures and that there's success in multiple different ways. It's not necessarily about getting into that elite college. Um, are you concerned about that at all with the school you're working with right now? Uh, you know, keep in mind that everything I did was I kind of took Nadia's lead on, Nadia being Miss Lopez. Um, and so I deferred to what she thought was best for her students. Mm -hmm. And she didn't think that their main problem was thinking that they couldn't find anything to do. It was thinking that the upper echelons of success were close to them and weren't even options that were worth striving for. Um, she, you know, and I've heard this, and, and I mean, you sound like you've had a lot of experience in, in neighborhoods such as this, but one thing I always hear from educators in these neighborhoods is how difficult it is for these students to, to, to look beyond a 10 block radius that they live in because they're not mobile. They don't have the money to travel. And so their role models are in that 10 block radius. Their entire, the, the entire world that they peg their view of life is in that 10 block radius and it's very constricted both economically. And so I'm, I'm a big believer in the symbol of breaking out of that in a, in a big way and being exposed to these kind of, whether it be the Oval Office or Harvard University, and just to show these kids that, yeah, there is this, even if just to give them a sense of the mystery of the world and the access as opposed to, I want to go to Harvard and major in this, but just to almost inspire them with the vastness of what's out there and what's available to them. And, and like I said, you know, again, I was very careful in this whole thing to really defer to what Ms. Lopez was thought was best for her students. Yeah. Hi, Brandon. My name is Tiffany. I'm a sophomore in the college. Um, I know you said that Humans of New York is sort of your own solo project, but um, how do you feel about young people and young artists who try to emulate the work that you do um, and try to hear their own stories from different people and get that moment of authenticity? Um, that was an evolution in itself. Um, at first, I was worried about it because I was broke and sleeping on a mattress on the floor and not paying my rent. And I was like, oh, no, it's my idea. No, you know. Um, but then I just, I, 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 I evolved and, I, and I, very early on I evolved. And I just, first of all, the concept in itself, I think, is a good thing. I think it's good for both the individual and the community for people to be talking to, to each other. And so to try to look at that in a, you know, in a capitalist way and say, this is my concept, this is my commodity, I think is, is immoral. Um, and you know, just beyond that, I just, I think, I, I don't think that any of these other humans of projects just take away from what I'm doing in any, any way. I just think it expands on it. Um, People will discover humans of Melbourne or humans of Sydney, and then, you know, it's only going to be a matter of time till they're following humans of New York and humans of Fiji, if the, if they're interested in that. Um, so, like I said, you know, it it was an evolution. I wish I could say that I was Bob Marley about it the whole time. Kumbaya, let's all do it. But yeah, you know, I I because you know you get a lot of advice to the contrary, and and you if you guys are like you you get a lot of people being like, oh, that's your brand. You got to protect your brand. You know, get a trademark. What are you doing? Like this is horrible. This is horrible. And so it's you know you kind of have to ground yourself and do your own analysis of the, of the situation. Um, and yeah, and ultimately I just decided not only as you know a concept was it you know morally correct to encourage people to do it as, as much as possible, but even as a brand. Um, you know, I think it only helps in the discovery po process of people discovering my work. Yeah. Hi Brandon, thank you for coming. My name is Mason Mark and I'm a senior at the college. My question oh. is, sort of bringing it full circle now, um, what is or what was going through your mind the first time you specifically took a photo of someone for your Humans of New York blog? Um, yeah, I think the there is a, and I normally have that photo. Um, it wasn't before Humans of New York existed, like the kind of the spark of inspiration that kind of fueled the whole thing was the first time I took like a portrait of somebody. Because that was like the first time I thought I had something to add to the world of photography. 
because it's just like it took some courage. Like I remember it was uh, there was there were these two kids on a subway. It was back in, it was when I was still living in Chicago, and they didn't know each other, and they were both with their moms, and they were both looking up at the same sign, and they had the same exact same look on their face. And I just, I, I wanted that picture so bad, and I got the courage, and I took it. And I remember having the feeling that, that, you know, I hadn't been photographing that long, but that was something special. I, I could do something special and something different. And ever since that moment, it was all pictures of people. Um, and so Humans in New York as itself didn't exist as a name, but that was when I started taking pictures of people and, you know, thinking that there was something I could contribute to the world, I guess, in, in, in that way. And so that was the feeling. It was just a, a feeling of having created something new. Yeah. Hi, Brandon. Um, my name is Diana. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and I have to say, I really loved your New York um, photos, but then I really loved your pictures in abroad. Um, and I was wondering if you could pick a place and a kind of environment that you envision, envision yourself in right now with your camera, where would that be? Uh, where, just moving forward, where do you think I'm, I'm going to be doing? Yeah, and you know, I, I kind of, I touched on that earlier, you know. I mean, just as a, forgetting art and forgetting business and forgetting brand, I'm also a person and I want to travel while I'm young. You know what I mean? Um, and so that desire might infuse the future, you know, of where it goes beyond how many books I'm going to sell or how many people how many people are following the blog because of New York and how many people are following the blog because of humans. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, there is a group of each side. Um, so, you know, it's a, lot of, a lot of the decisions moving forward are going to be, you know, based on, you know, not only what do I want to do with humans in New York, but what do I want to be doing in this time of my life. Um, and so I, I'm, leaning, I'm leaning towards doing a lot more travel, yeah. Okay, so this is the last question. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Becca. I'm a sophomore at Tufts University. Um, so when you went on your world tour, um, for a lot of your followers, um, your photos were sort of their main point of entry into those other cultures and other worlds. So how did you make sure that the people and the countries that you were representing were being represented in a fair way? Um, I didn't, um, and I was very up about that, you know, because it, it's impossible. I'm one guy, you know, and so instead of, you know, I did my best. I tried to go to some rural areas, some, you know, city areas, but at the same time, I was very upfront. I'm spending four days in each one of these countries. I actually wrote this, you know, this is not a guy going to different countries and depicting them. These, this is a guy traveling around the world having conversations with strangers. You know, um, and so I was, I was very careful to frame the expectations um, because I knew what you said would be impossible. It would be impossible to portray a country accurately or fairly, and it's impossible for anyone to do that. You know, some, one of the questions the Crimson asked me, which was, you know, a great question, was, you know, do you not worry about creating caricatures out of these people that you photograph, you know, just by featuring a, a little bit of them? And I say yes, but I'm a huge fan of biographies. And I'm telling those are a thousand pages each. And those might almost do more to misrepresent the man because there's a, the expectation that the man or the woman is encapsulated in that book. Whereas in I am just looking for a glimpse into a stranger's life. And I feel that I'm, I'm very upfront that that's all it is, is a glimpse. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And thank you for coming.